Okay, everybody, we have reached the bottom of the hour. So let's get started with today's L10 webinar, Customer Relationships Unmasked Part 2, Ask Me Anything, sponsored by CMR Institute. My name is Tim Sosby. I'm Editorial Director for L10. It's my pleasure to welcome you today and to serve as our host of our program. I'm going to start here with some housekeeping items very quickly. First of all, we are planning a 60-minute session for you. So you notice that your phones are on mute today. Any questions you might have, I'm going to ask you to send in using the questions feature on the control panel there on the right side of your screen. This is sort of an ask me anything webinar today. So if you have any questions, do send them in. We will get to them as quickly as we can throughout today's webinar or toward the end of the hour. But it's always good to get the questions in while they're fresh in your mind. And we will get to your questions or take the answers offline. But again, ask us anything, send those questions in today. And please do use that questions module for them. Also, I wanted to point out on the control panel, there are several items there you may wish to download in the handouts window, including a copy of today's uh, presentation slide deck. There's also some information on the L10 2020 calendar of events, and there's uh, some information, uh, save the date information on the L10 2021 annual conference. We'd love to have you join us for that as well. You can download any or all of those. Just highlight the title. It'll walk you through downloading. And should you have any questions, you can reach out to me and I can connect you with the handouts offline as well. I also going to put, tell you about one more thing. I'm putting something in the chat window right now for you all. It's a link to a resources page on the CMR website the CMR folks have put together for us today. We'll tell you more about it later. But there's several resources around today's program that you might find valuable on that site. And you'll also be able to access the recording through that site, too, I believe, later on as well, of course, once we're done. So uh, feel free to look, grab that recording while you can and have that URL while you can. And we'll share that URL with you later in today's program as well. Uh, as I mentioned, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand through the L10 uh, on demand uh, uh, library, self directed learning library, and also through the CMR site as well. We'll connect you with those and follow up emails coming from the CMR team. And uh, speaking of following up, as you leave today's webinar, our follow-up survey is going to appear in a separate browser window. Please do take a moment and look for that survey and share your thoughts with us after today's program when you leave. Your, we produce these programs for you, so your feedback is always appreciated. And then along those lines, there's my email address. Again, if I can help you with anything, the handouts, uh, any feedback, anything around today, your, uh, today's webinar or your LTEM membership, never hesitate to reach out. Okay, with all of that said, I'm going to get us started with today's program. You've been seeing our panelists sitting waiting patiently for me to finish the housekeeping, and now it's their turn to take over. I'm going to start by turning things over to our moderator today, Laura Hedmer. Laura is a healthcare writer and editor with Vital Communications. She's the former editor of l Focus magazine. Today, she writes for several industry publications covering healthcare finance, policy and legislation, health information technology, innovation, and of course the COVID-19 pandemic. Laura, thanks for being here with us today. I'm going to turn things over to you now. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I'm going to start out by introducing our panelists. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, welcome back Dr. Anthony Slonim. He's the president and CEO of Renown Health. Dr. Slonim has led Nevada's only locally owned not-for-profit integrated health system since 2014. And last year, he was named one of the 50 most influential clinical executives by Modern Healthcare. He's also chairman of CMR Institute's board of directors, and of course, he's a familiar face on our webinars. So Dr. Slonim, thanks for joining us today. Laura, it's always great to be with you. Hi, everybody. Next, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kashyap Patel. Uh, he is the CEO of Carolina Blood and Cancer Care Associates. Uh, Dr. Patel has been working directly with cancer patients for the past 20 years. He's also the president-elect of COA, which represents independent oncology practices across the country. He's also the author of a book that I have here, uh, Between Life and Death, From Despair to Hope. Dr. Patel, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Laura, and thank you for inviting me to speak on this, this webinar. And as you can see, COVID-19 has changed so many things that I'm in my scrubs today because it's my day to see patients. But I'll, I, I've been able to block an hour for this webinar because I think it's very important for every listener to know how we all can huddle together, get together, 
and get over this crisis that's once in lifetime. I think our grandchildren will have to take our notes and read about what we went through during this pandemic. Well, thank you, Dr. Patel. We're, we're so excited to have you join us today. So um, let me start off by going over the learning objectives for what we hope to accomplish today. So um, first, we'd like to help you identify some approaches that could help you overcome customers' reluctance to meet and help you keep their attention during a virtual or an in-person presentation. Second, we hope to describe some strategies for selling in-person and virtually that can help you and your team deliver value and build better relationships with physicians and physician executives. And then third, we hope to help you understand how COVID-19 has affected decision-making in physician practices and in health systems and help you recognize what the implications are for the future. So before we actually chat with the panel, though, I wanted to ask a question of our audience, and that relates to the future, specifically what you think your greatest training challenge is going to be in the coming year. So Tim, can you help us with that poll, please? Thank you, Laura. Well, I'm going to launch the poll right now, folks. We'd love to get your vote on this. A window should be popping up for you to make your selection. What do you think will be your biggest training challenge in 2021? Pick A, if it's helping reps gain access to customers. B, if it's keeping pace with ongoing industry changes. C, if it's training reps on how to improve their virtual selling. D, if it's creating a training strategy amidst uncertainty. Or E, if it's doing more with less. So again, the biggest challenge, please select one. All right, it looks like this is a hard choice for some people. The votes are coming in, but there's a lot of... Um, similarities somewhere. Well, you know, I, I wanted to, I didn't want to offer the choice of all of the above because I thought mm -hmm. that was cheating. So I wanted to make sure that everyone could pick one and I know it's going to be hard. So we're going to see what, what the audience has to say and then uh, get the panel's responses too. Thanks. It looks like the votes are almost, and everybody, I'm going to ask you to wrap up your choices. You just want to keep the program moving forward for you. And I'm going to give you a hint, one is merging forward as a winner here, a winner, so to speak. All right, everybody, thanks so much for sharing with us. And let me close the poll, and we're going to share the results with you. And here they are. Okay, I'm not seeing anything on, on my screen. What, what do you see on yours, Tim? Oh, I'm sorry about that. 45% uh, was the, A was the top answer. 45% of the audience said, A, helping reps gain customer access is they're going to be their biggest challenge. Okay, great. Followed by 21% thought uh, uh, the biggest challenge is C, training reps on how to improve virtual selling skills. And then D and E uh, tied for 14%. That's um, uh, uncertainty and doing more with less. Okay, great. All right. So that's good to know. It's the big winner was customer access. Okay, thanks, Tim. Okay, why don't we go ahead and then um, move on to the next slide. So, you know, obviously we're going to touch on all of these challenges with the panel today, but I'd like to start out with that first question. So before this webinar, we actually asked the audience members to send in questions in advance. Hence the title, Ask, Ask Us Anything. And we wanted to get a sense for what you would want to ask a healthcare provider or a um, IDN executive on what you, know, what, um, what you could possibly ask them any question. So I'm going to start with a, one of the most popular questions that came in, and that is, to what extent do you see sales reps being able to return to their prior level of access? to your hospital or physician office. So Dr. Slonim, I'm going to start by asking you this question. What do you think? Well, thank you, Laura, and a great question. I don't know that um, access has been limited. I think access has changed. So we're using a lot of technology now to have appointments. We're still, even with our senior team, not doing in-person visits. Um, amongst our meetings. Uh, I think with uh, with this week's activities and week over week increases in COVID and, and the pandemic across the nation, I mean, this morning, pretty much every state is in an increase in context. Uh, that's not going to open up anytime soon. And when you layer on top of that the influenza, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it challenges the ways we gain access. 
but frankly, we're still working, we're still meeting, it's just a little bit differently. And so I think we have to figure out the, how we get in uh, access points uh, to, to the degree that we can do it differently. Um, same access, same people are in place. Thank you, Dr. Slonim. Dr. Patel, what about you? I'd like to ask you the same question. I mean, are you, are you currently allowing reps into your office? I know you've got all those special challenges because you're dealing with cancer patients. So what kind of level of access have you been able to maintain? So I think first of all, our duty is to protect patients and the visitors both. So I'm equally concerned about any, even the drug rep walking in the office because they potentially can get COVID from the patients as well. Fortunately, we have a beautiful healing dome that can be accessed from the back of the office without coming in contact with the patient. So if there is a rep who probably has a new product that they want to talk to us desperately, they want to have like face-to-face -face meeting because they feel that, you know, it's something that will help them a lot, which we do it on a very limited extent. And there is no discrimination. Anyone who probably kind of becomes persistent, we do kind of allow that. And we have a almost like 30 feet diameter copper dome. So we have a social distance that we can maintain. And again, it's an open space. They walk from the open kind of parking lot straight into the dome and we stay about 10 feet from them so that we protect them first. And that's how we try to see them. But I'm always responding to my email. I always respond to my text. I'm always on LinkedIn. So I would say that I've had at least about a hundred plus professional colleagues, different level of the pharma industry, they have reached out to me on LinkedIn and email. And I always respond back and kind of, you know, try to help and solve whatever the challenges are. And again, we cannot win this war alone. Now we all have to get together, first of all, to protect the lives. And then at the same time, allow the human interaction to go on unabatedly. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Patel. I'd like to, since you uh, serve on the board for COA too, I was wondering if you could maybe speak more broadly to whether you think sales reps are going to be able to return to their prior level of access to community-based physician offices like yours. Do you, do you see that happening? Once the pandemic is over, I think that's going to happen. I think we are, you know, I'm a human being. I like the touch, the feel of the person. So that definitely will happen. I don't think this is going to change the landscape forever. I mean, there will be some way that we'll figure out how to uh, do remote work, but but remote work is starting. You know, I've been on Zoom calls, for example, I had my co-op board meeting for eight hours and I was shattered. I would rather be in person somewhere. So I, I do realize that as much as we think that, you know, for big companies, tech companies will be working remotely, I don't think that will work in healthcare. I think people will go back to their usual in-person conference and meeting. They may not be as intense and as frequent as what they were before, but I do think that that will change and that probably will go back to 80, 90% of the pre-COVID level. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Dr. Slonim, what about what about in Reno? What what level of access have, have reps had to physician offices in your area? Yeah, in the physician's offices, we're still allowing people to come in. Uh, the hospitals, though, are still off base. And I think an important point, uh, Laura, that, that people can learn from is, and we've been talking about this now for many, many years, the game has been changing, right? So I always say, don't sell to me, provide me information that can help my patients advance the work that we're doing. And one of the things that COVID did, so while I think I, I agree with Dr. Patel that access will go back, uh, to uh, the process of access. We'll go back to where it was. Those areas that are now closed off will open up again. But one of the things that we've doubled down on in the last three or four months while we've been managing the pandemic is we've completely changed our business model. So we're, we're doubling down on value-based care. We're doubling down on best quality, lowest cost options for executing for our community. And the people that come back and want to still do it the traditional way are going to be in a very different place. I mean, we are advancing this work faster than than life itself, actually. While there's while there's so many things going on with the pandemic, we're advancing strategy even faster because we know we can't tolerate the reductions in volume, 
You know, one third of our emergency visits are down, 30% of our office visits are down, hospital visits are down. Across the board, we can't keep doing it the way we were doing it. So while we've been on the journey for five or six years, there are organizations who have now, all of them, we've been, we've been actually having these conversations, Laura, here at L10 and in other places, to help industry realize the game is changing and it just changed overnight. We will not be able to tolerate the reductions in volume or continue to manage in a volume-based world anymore. It's about volume. So for all of you guys out there, don't think about getting back access-wise in the same old process. Think of what you're going to do because the industry has changed overnight. Mm -hmm. that, that's a really great point, Dr. Slonim, and I think that points to some of the training opportunities, too, that... Uh, our audience can look at for the coming year. Um, certainly the need for increased knowledge about value-based care, um, understanding how uh, health system and physician practice finances are changing now, uh, understanding some of the cost pressures that they're under, all of that is going to be important in order to present the right types of solutions to you know, Laura, I would add as well, and we, we actually, we've been talking about alternate customer, alternative customers, right? And so one of the things we know is that uh, health plans have not had such a reduction in their revenue streams because they're simply not paying for care. People are not going as much, and, and we expect that that will change. But don't, don't eliminate the health plan as a customer base. Think differently about who your customers are and where you might access them. I know in our health plan, again, we're doubling down on value, but we're all about risk-based contracting right now. Come on in. Love to talk to you even more now than a couple of years ago. Thanks, Dr. Slonim. And that, that actually parlays a little bit into the next question because, you know, as, as you recall from the poll that we just did, the audience mentioned that access was an issue. So I'd like to ask the audience another question, and this relates to their success level in securing virtual sales calls. So Tim, can you help us out with that poll, please? And Laura, I'm going to launch a poll now, everybody. We'd love to find out from you. How successful have you or your reps been in securing virtual sales calls with customers? You have four options here. First option is, your sales team has been able to get calls with at least half of their customers. Second option is uh, virtual calls with uh, between one quarter and one half of the customers. Third option, if your sales team has had virtual calls with less than one quarter of the customers. Or D, not yet implemented virtual selling. And everybody's voting quickly. Thank you so much for that. Laura, the results are going to be in shortly. Great. So this is interesting because we asked the same question when we did our webinar in May, and I'm curious to see what has changed in the past few months. It'll be an interesting uh, little experiment here. And folks, mm -hmm. if you can wrap up your uh, choices in just the next couple of seconds here, I'll go ahead and close off the polling and we can uh, check that out. Great, everybody, thanks so much for sharing. I appreciate that. I'm gonna close the poll now. And Laura, hopefully you will see these results. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, all right, so this is interesting. So um, we have 21% who said that they have been able to get calls with at least half of their customers. So virtual calls with at least half of their customers. So that's, uh, that's double what the percentage was in May when only 10% said that they could get virtual calls. And um, let's see, in May, back in May, 60% uh, said that they had virtual calls with fewer than one quarter of their customers. And today, um, that percentage is 41%. So um, that's still the majority. Um, so clearly, there's, there's still uh, significant room for improvement. So um, let's then move on and talk with our panel about how we can hopefully improve success with getting these virtual calls. So Dr. Slonim, let me ask uh, the first question of you. Um, I know you get a lot of requests for meetings. So what is likely to get your attention? What's, 
likely to make you respond to an email request for a virtual meeting, especially in the current environment. Yeah, you know, Laura, I think it hasn't changed. It's same old, same old for me. Um, to the extent that people who want to meet with me have done their work, done their research, and know what is what I'm passionate about, and how what they have helps me execute my priorities for my community, that's magical. And so of all of the emails uh, that I get and all of the other ways that people contact me, last week, uh, just last week actually, some guy uh, reached out to me on LinkedIn and I get a lot of LinkedIn contacts, but he had done his homework and within 24 hours, him and I were on a webinar because he understood what I was trying to accomplish and offered me a product that made that easy. Love it. I mean, I'm willing to give people the time if they've done their work to make our lives easier at providing for our community. Thanks, Dr. Sloan. You also mentioned uh, risk-based contracting earlier. So that's something that would be interesting for you? Absolutely. Across the board, again, we're doubling down. We don't have, it's not anymore about a volume-based world. It's about how we're going to go about driving our value proposition. We actually have a, our strategy team calls it the journey to value. And we are moving this forward, not only in the way that our primary care group is now organizing the way they see patients in a team-based model, but how they're going at risk with provider contracts, with how we're going at risk with um, with contracting on technology and how we're going at risk with contracting on pharmaceuticals and other devices. So I think it's front and center for us. This is about making the value proposition real. Do you get a sense, Dr. Splonum, that account managers, hospital reps who are calling on you, do they do they really understand your challenges as a hospital CEO right now? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand my challenge. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, every day is a new adventure, um, frankly. But you know, and and it's important that you keep uh, in balance. People tend to think that we are completely overwhelmed and preoccupied with COVID. And the reality of it is, here in Nevada, at least, you know, we've had. We watched the virus and the pandemic migrate from Europe to the East Coast, from the East Coast to the West Coast. We've had time to prepare over those intervening months that have been a blessing for us. They have allowed us to do the right work. We set up an alternate care site in our parking garage, added 1,500 beds to it. I mean, we've got the things we need now. And so, we're not, day-to-day -day operations is not taken up with COVID. We're moving our strategy forward because COVID and the influenza problem are here to stay, frankly. So we'll get through this like we do, but we have to continue to execute on the other things that are important for our community. That's COVID, of course, but not only COVID. Thanks, Dr. Slonim. So if I'm to, if I'm a trainer and I'm trying to extract what the training opportunity is for me from what you just said. So I'm I'm guessing that there's still that that need for the fundamentals of market access and understanding the fundamentals of, um, of business planning and having that business acumen to, to be able to present the right types of solutions to a hospital CEO. Exactly. And you know, again, we've we've referred people generally to common area, you can't just make a cold call, you can sometimes, but it also helps if it's aligned with what people are doing. So on my website, because we're, you know, we've got our, we've just completed a community health needs assessment. So there are the priority areas we're working on as a not-for-profit organization. And in our, we've just put our strategy documents online and we've defined four specific areas of focus for us that we call world-class care. They include neurosciences, cardiovascular care, oncology care, and pediatric care. So for people who have a product offering in one of those areas, they should be you know, ringing my phone off the hook, trying to meet with me as a way of advancing their products to help me deliver on those four core areas. And I, you know, 
you know, so I, I think that guidance, Laura, is important because um, it's not happening. People are not doing it right. We've got in this context, we just announced a new partnership with the university and we're integrating the medical school. We signed a letter of intent. People should be all over how they understand the new relationship with us and what that might mean as a customer base because the markets consolidate. So previously calling on university doctors, previously calling on round doctors, now the doctors are going to be one. What does that mean? Nobody's asking. Thanks, Dr. Slonim. Dr. Patel, let me turn it over to you. Was there anything that Dr. Slonim said that, that especially resonated with you about um, whether reps understand your challenges or um, how, how your needs have changed recently? So I want to answer it in two different ways. I want to follow up on this value based care as well, but let me answer the question on the on the reps understanding challenges. So I think we do Zoom calls. We understand their kind of desire to get in touch with us. One thing that I actually try to tell them is that, again, you know, for Dr. Sloan, and COVID may not exist. For me, it does exist very much because I'm an independent practice and I see patients every day. I have to maintain social distance. So I'm not discounting COVID at all as, a, as any poo-poo. I think it's a real thing. We'll be seeing about maybe uh, between 50 to 60,000 deaths every month for next few months. And one death is all. So for me, I think it's not a number, it's real, it's real thing. So for that reason, I tell them that because COVID poses a real challenge in operation side, <clears throat> I want you to understand and instead of taking an hour worth of time on a Zoom call, pause at 15 minutes, because I think we we need to have succinct messages. Now, come back to value-based care. I've walked the talk. I don't talk the talk. We are one of the most successful OCM practice in the country. Uh, we have achieved our PBP for six terms. With that, I regularly interact with Administrator Seema Verma, the CMS administrator. I work with CMMI regularly. We work with HSS secretary. I've been to the White House as well, at least about six times. to work on the healthcare reform and what's needed in the next phase of value-based care. So <clears throat> I've been I've been walking this talk for the last 10 years. 80% of my patients are in value-based care contracting. So I exactly understand what it is. But at the time of the COVID, we actually asked him to push back because we said you cannot have the VBC calculation based on the pre-COVID days because COVID actually changed the whole equation. If a patient goes to hospital, it costs $35,000 and it kind of blows up the whole thing. So, so I, I walk this talk, I don't talk the talk. So you mentioned Dr. Patel, OCM, and for our audience members who may not be in the oncology space, that's the oncology cure model and it's a, uh, it's a value-based payment a, it's model. Value -based model. It's an alternate payment model going to last for five years and based on the success of this model, CMS has decided to bring in another model called OCF, Oncology Care First. And I was invited to speak in front of CMMI in DC about in last November, probably November 4th, I remember. And our input has been, I've had at least about uh, 10 meetings with CMMI on behalf of the Payment Reform Committee as a chairman for the Community Oncology Alliance. I've published about 15 papers. If you Google my name and video me, I think that there are about 100 plus talks I've given on the value based care and, and OCM. It's, it's, it's a reality of life. We are not going to see any more fee for service model. We are not going to see any more value volume based care. If you're not part of the alternate payment model, whether you're looking into the oncology, cardiology, orthopedics, or any specialty, as a part of being QPP or the MIPS track, every physician with an NPI number, a provider with the NPI number, has a risk of losing 9% or risk of getting bonus of 9% based on the performance on the QPP quality payment program track. So, so value-based care is not a future. It's been here 2022 January onwards every NP number will be either rewarded 9% bonus or be penalized 9% bonus. And again, I've been walking this talk since 2010, and I'm one of the most recognized authority at least in the oncology space. So Dr. Patel, bringing that then to the question of access, what if a rep is proposing a virtual meeting with you, what, what can they include in their email that 
touches on those issues that you just mentioned that reflects the fact that they understand that you're involved in value-based payment models, what, what, what kind of uh, invitation are you most likely to respond to? So I really want to have an understanding of the, say, if there's a new product that has come out recently and Rep wants to talk to me, I ask them about, they, have they done their work on the HUR, health economic outcomes research? Have they, has the company done any work on the pharmacoeconomics, total cost of care? Because end of the day, if a drug improves 6% outcome, but if it makes patient go and spend 10 weeks out of 15 weeks in the hospital, that's not good for my patient. That's not good for me because I don't believe that, you know, the, in, in the targeted oncology area that we need to worry about that sort of complications. COVID also has taught us that patients can live without hospitals. If you look into, in our area, 700 plus elective cardiac cats were dropped and they did not increase mortality from cardiovascular disease. So it, what it shows is that a lot of hospital-based expenses can be curtailed and when you transfer that into value-based care, so coming back to the total cost of care is what's important for me to understand on the drug piece. CAR T cell therapy, for example, you know, excellent alternative. But CMS asked the manufacturer that you need to do two years of prospective registry to progress with the economics data to see if you indeed reduce the cost of care and improve outcome or just increase the cost. So I think I want the drug rep to tell me what are the side effects? How do they help me improve the value, not the cost or the volume? Thank you, Dr. Patel. Uh, Dr. Slonim, I saw you nodding, so I'm hoping you can help me kind of distill, again, for our training audience, what what the takeaway is from what you and Dr. Patel were just mentioning. So. Um, more training on HEOR, more training on um, evidence-based selling, more training on some of the oncology models or uh, mm -hmm. emerging new payment models. Yeah, I, I think that's that's right, Laura. More training, more training, more training. The, um, as Dr. Patel points out, for those of us that have been doing this work for a long, long time on value, Value proposition is about driving quality up and the total cost of care down. And he was right, I was nodding on the total cost of care. I don't care that the unit cost of a drug is more. As long as my total cost of delivering that drug improves outcomes and drives the total cost down. That's the value proposition for me. And if I can administer the drug once a month instead of every day, I get better compliance, I get better outcomes, even if that drug is more costly on the unit basis, the administration costs are much further out. And that's where the rep needs to be so familiar with their product that they can make those points again, as Dr. Patel said, in a very succinct and direct manner. The other thing I would add to the conversation, because I think this is real, again, we're still learning about COVID. And so one of the places where we've struggled as a country and, and in healthcare and as an industry is that we've done a, a relatively poor job at managing chronic conditions. And we know that chronic conditions you know, lead to waste and lead to challenges and lead to further complications. And COVID, the virus, uh, overlays a new set of chronic conditions that we still don't understand. The cardiovascular effects, the neurological effects, the potential oncologic effects that will take years to develop. We know that viruses can be oncogenic and we don't know what COVID can do in that space. The pulmonary effects, on and on and on. All of our health systems have potential ramifications from this virus we still don't understand yet. And so what I believe to, uh, to be in our future is that the burden of chronic illness is going to increase, not only from a baseline of the things that have been there, hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, but the overlay of chronic conditions caused by the virus. And that still requires us to understand that it, it will take months to years to figure that out.
Thank you, Dr. Sonam, for that perspective. That's, that's very helpful and sobering in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask another question of our audience. And this comes to, you know, we're, we've been talking a bit about uh, virtual sales calls. And I'd like to know a little bit more about what some of the challenges are that you're facing out in the audience so that we can ask the panelists for some ideas, for some strategies on how they can, how you might be able to address some of those challenges. So Tim, can you help us with the next poll, please? I can, Laura, thank you. Let me go ahead and launch that poll out for everybody. And folks, if you can go ahead and make your choice, what has been the most challenging aspect of conducting virtual sales presentations with your customers? You can pick A, if it's keeping the customer's attention, B, if it's adjusting your face-to-face -face selling skills to a virtual environment. C, if it's knowing what solutions to present during the virtual sales call. Or D, if it's creating credibility from a distance. And I see the votes again are coming in quickly. Everybody appreciate that. All right, folks, since we're almost there, I'm going to give everybody just another couple of seconds, and I'll close off the polling for us today. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. All right, everybody, thanks again for sharing. Let me go ahead and close the poll, and Laura, here are the results. Okay, all right, so uh, the big winner was adjusting your face-to-face -face selling skills to virtual, so that was 37%. Um, about a quarter of you said keeping your customers' attention was the biggest challenge. And then um, the other two, knowing what solutions to present and then creating credibility from a distance, those were tied uh, with about 19%. So, you know, pretty evenly split. So, um, Tim, thank you for that. Um, let's move on to the next slide and our, our panelists and ask them for some ideas on how you or your sales team can overcome some of these challenges that were just identified. So um, the again, the audience mentioned that adjusting uh, their face-to-face -face selling skills to a virtual environment was the greatest challenge for them. So Dr. Sloan, I'm going to start with you. What do you think reps should do differently when they're selling to you virtually versus in person? Yeah, you know, Blur, one of the strategies that I've seen work for people, uh, and uh, I'm and you're using it right here, which is keep your audience engaged. Ask them a question. When I'm on a call and I don't want to have 20 minutes of presentation, I want to have an interaction. I want to have a relationship building experience. And that comes about by someone asking me, hey, Dr. Sloan, we've got this, um, this new medication that we think can improve the overall chronic conditions of heart failure in your community. Um, how much of a priority is heart failure for you and Renown, Dr. Sloan? Right, that, that drives the dialogue in a way that's meaningful for me. I can't be distracted by my phone or by email. I have to stay in the game. And it sets the um, conversation up in a different way as we're engaging, right? Versus I was on a call earlier this morning that was 90 minutes of blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, done shut my camera, go somewhere else, multitask, do whatever it is. We're, we're, that's the one place where I think the technology gets in our way because you can't see people, you can't depend on them to be with you in the conversation. So you have to drive them into the conversation. Thanks, Dr. Sonam. Dr. Patel, do you have anything to add about what uh, sales reps can do to adjust their face-to-face selling skills to a virtual environment? You know, I paused in between because I had a sales rep who just showed up in our home. So I just wanted to give you live information and she just dropped this for us. So I am just want to let you know that we still have some interaction. So I think, you know, as long as their meetings are very succinct, they, they kind of, they email us what they want to talk about before, how much time would they need? 
and how comfortable they are and are they willing to kind of you know put their mask on are they willing to work so we we want to like i said accommodate it every human being's need at the end of the day i don't see human being as a machine and when look into my book you know the traditional approach is treating the piece of meat in the body and i treat the human being with abnormal meat and that's the difference between a lot of my colleagues who look at we take reductionist approach of just targeting the abnormal tissue and not understanding that there's a human being behind it who's a husband a wife a cousin a friend a colleague and if you take that ecosystem approach i think we can we can do a whole lot better so coming back to the drug rep i look at them as not somebody selling drug a or drug b i look at them as you know jenny perkins who comes here to talk to me about a product and and she needs to be treated with respect she cannot be discounted for because she's just in the drug business so but to match her time and my expectations i request them that you know would you let me know what you want to talk about how much time will you need and that sets expectations for me for my patient as well as her thanks dr patel so I'd also like to, you know, I in some of the in responding to some of the other challenges that the audience um, responded to, they mentioned that keeping your customers' attention was an issue. I think I think both of you have talked uh, have addressed some strategies for keeping customers, uh, keeping physicians' attention on a call. Um, you also talked about what potential solutions to present during a virtual call um, in by way of value-based. Uh, solutions. What about the credibility issue, though? How do you, how can a sales representative create credibility from a distance? Dr. Slonim, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I I give people the benefit of the doubt. They don't need to know my business. They need to know kind of the context and the circumstances. So I don't need people to be necessarily experts in value-based care, but they need to understand the context. Of it. I don't need them to know everything that's going on in in Reno, Nevada, our community is very heterogeneous and they've got 15 other communities like it that they're responsible for, but they need to know enough about what we're doing in our priorities to be able to make an impact and, and hook me, connect me. I mean, I think it goes back to, you know, sales 101, which is how you make sure you're engaging people in a conversation and relationship that's meaningful for them. You got to know what they're interested in in order to get them there. Thank you, Dr. Slonim. Dr. Patel, do you have any thoughts on how salespeople can establish credibility on a virtual call with you? I think as long as they stick to the point, uh, again, I think recognizing the challenges of where we are right now, if they stick to the most succinct point of presenting the evidence, presenting the facts, and presenting, again, the, the relative value in the cost of care, I mean, total cost of care model, I probably would feel that they are actually coming back with the holistic purpose of aligning our interests with them and that probably would be aligned with the national interest of how to improve the quality of care reduce the cost of care and keep the outcomes same or improve the outcomes thank you dr patel okay so um let's move on to the impact on decision making we're going to just spend a few minutes here but i i don't want to miss it because it was one of the questions, one of the popular questions that came in when we asked the um, audience to to send in their questions in advance. Um, so we know that uh, the pandemic has affected most providers' revenue streams, and Dr. Slonim, you, you touched on this right at the beginning of our webinar. So can you talk a little bit about how that's affected your decision-making around partnerships and, um, say, your selection of capital equipment and, and those kinds of big decisions? Yeah, uh, double down. We are moving on uh, on our strategy. We are not letting COVID get in the way. Um, so a couple of things I would say in this context. We just went out, got another bond rating. I just went to the bond market two weeks ago, took another $350 million out, and I'm going to execute my strategy, irrespective of COVID. $30 million in the OR, building a new master facility plan with two campuses, going, 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 not stopping. And so for people that want to anchor the conversation on COVID, we, again, part of our day work now, not part of our strategic work. Um, and so 
help us get to strategy. And that's that's where we're focused as an IGN. And we're continuing to make calls every day on uh, advancing the care we're providing for the community. So, Dr. Sloan, what about, you know, looking ahead to next year, is there another business trend that that our audience should know about that's really impacting you that maybe they might have missed? You know, Laura, everybody's made a, a really um, focused point about um, telehealth and telecare and those kinds of things in the industry. And I think they're helpful. I will, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't see patients anymore like Dr. Patel, but I will, I, I think telemedicine can only get you so far, honestly. Um, right now, I'll share a, a quick story of, of my son, who was an 18 year old, perfectly healthy kid who was having some stomach upset. And you, know, you can't have a gastroenterology visit without putting your hands on somebody's belly, right? Or you can take the history, but you can't. The automatic response should not be get a CAT scan. The response should be put your hands on a belly and feel it and know that there's nothing there that you have to worry about. You don't need the CAT scan to tell you. And I think those examples are, we, we're missing it. Dr. Patel alludes this, it's very important. You've got to continue to treat the patient even with the technology in place. And if someone would have just done something very simple, like ask him his dietary regimen, and the fact that he drinks five Red Bulls a day, they would have figured he was upset. He didn't need a CAT scan. Uh, you know, so simple things are simple, still. Always blame the Red Bull. Right. <laughs> All right, thanks, Dr. Slonim. So, Dr. Patel, let me let me move on to you and ask you the same question about decision making. Can you talk a little bit about how COVID nineteen has affected decision making at community based oncology practices like yours? So that's a great question. You know, going back to Dr. Slonim's point, I think I'm I'm a touch and hug guy, so I, I definitely want to see patients. There's not a single day that we close our operations. I think we we continue to staff full, not a single day that we stopped our operation. We are seeing patients at full capacity. And what we've done is, for example, those patients who could come after six months instead of three months, we try to kind of space out their visit. So the role of telehealth has allowed me to follow patients who are coming for surveillance visit to more longer interval. We've also tried to shift patients away from IV chemotherapy to oral now with the targeted therapies. We are making rapid strides. So for example, if a drug is approved in the second line in a certain condition, which is oral regimen and frontline is IV, we request the health plan to consider that to make it safe for patient because then they don't have to come back every week for infusion, but we can follow them on a regular regimen thing. And I wrote an article twice, I think, talking about oncology about how did we shift our paradigm, keeping COVID-19 in place to keep it safe for patients and us. But going back to Tony's point is that without touching the patient, it's always hard to make a second guess. So I always prefer if a patient calls, I say, I'll see you as long as you're willing to wait for an hour. So we take walk-in patients as well. We tell them that if you need to be seen, don't even wait to call. Show up at the door, you, you have to wait for a couple of hours, but we'll do that. But on that note, we are working with a large priority group to start oncology urgent care starting from 5 p.m. till 11 p.m. at night. We probably should start it operational from early spring because we feel that providing on-site access with IV hydration, IV antibiotic, testing will reduce hospitalization, will reduce the discomfort and also improve the quality of care. Thank you, Dr. Patel. So maybe Dr. Slonim, you could wrap up for us, you know, based on, on what what we've talked about related to decision making, is there, what what's the training opportunity there for our audience related to how they can make their reps more prepared to offer you value. Yeah, you know, I think um, between the two of us, you just heard uh, a frame of what's what's new, what's coming in the future. And so uh, Dr. Patel said, I'll say a little bit differently, but to the point, 
Hospitals are now ancillary to the execution of better health and well-being, right? We're moving our care into other settings. We're moving it, as Dr. Patel said, into an infusion centers. We're providing, because people don't want to go to the big hospital campus, frankly. They want to continue to move uh, in places where they might not catch the virus. So how are we uh, providing care that's at a higher level in the home, we're amping up our home care services. How are we using infusion centers differently? What's our urgent care profile look like in the community? Where are they scattered about? And how are we making sure that we have what I'll call a primary care network? I like to think of primary care as kind of a fabric. It should poke the community in a way that's important. You can use specialty care as a hub and spoke, you know, kind of have plops around the community, but the fabric of primary care is essential to making sure that people can get in when they need to and think about it differently. It's not only about hospital care. In fact, hospital care will go down and we've had the opportunity, we'll continue to stay down because it's the most expensive care and people don't want to go there. Thanks, Dr. Slonim. So what I'm hearing you say is that having an understanding of the evolving healthcare ecosystem is really going to be important for sales. Wow, you said it much better than I did, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Tim, why don't we, I, we've got a few minutes left to uh, take some questions from the audience. So, uh, Laura, can I just talk? attach oh, yeah, to one? Sure, yeah. So I really, it looks like, you know, Dr. Slonim is mind reader because uh, as a part of our new private equity group joint venture, we are looking at building up Medivan. So if a patient showed up at my oncology urgent care, who's my patient, neutropenic fever, doesn't have to be hospitalized, I would give him hydration at my clinic for the first time, but then we could look at sending equipped Medivan to their home, wherever they are, so that we can have a sterile in-home infusion of the appropriate supporting care treatment that improves the quality time that the patient has left for six months or a year to leave that reduces the cost of care improves the outcome and that's what i think is going to be the reality maybe five or some now i think five or some now hospitals will be like ancillary services the focus will be in patients home rather than everywhere else that's a great point dr patel thank you for making that so Tim, um, let's. I, we've just got a, a few minutes left for questions, and I, I don't want to skip that. So um, could you help us out and let us know if we've got any questions from the audience? I sure can, Laura. Thank you. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to make sure I point out. I'm going to send out everybody, uh, the audience. I'm going to send out the URL here again for today's resources on the CMR website. I just sent this URL here to you. The chat window you should be able to click right from the chat window to open up the cmr window where you can find today's resources around today's program if you do have any questions uh, send them on in using the questions module and let me start with these we have here uh, lined up already i'm going to start with this question from emily how had your needs changed during COVID 19 and how can the industry continue to meet your needs in today's environment dr patel i'm going to throw that one to you first all right, so our needs have changed primarily in protecting our staff and patients from getting infections. And, you know, the more I hear about it, the more I have to be cautious about that. So you look at the PPE need, look at the multiple other protections. I was so kind of, I would say, honored to find that few companies probably reached out to us. They said they have secured PPE. They cannot give it to us free because of the compliance issue, but their CEOs were packing this PPE. As long as we pay them the actual money that they paid for it, they were kind enough to send everything to us to make sure that we can continue to operate. So that's, I really want to thank my pharma partners for getting out of the kind of, you know, box and think through that. I think that industry can definitely recognize that it's a collective challenge. It's going to take the whole village to go through this. And if we work together, you know, by being cognizant of the security, safety, and health issues of the patients as well as physicians, I think we can work together to kind of elevate the anxiety of the interactions. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Dr. Slanam, I'm going to throw that question uh, to you as well, and that's uh, about um, how needs have changed. I think you've 
addressed that in some of your comments already, but I'm hoping maybe you could uh, put a spin on it. Is there, have there been any changing needs in the C-suite in particular, or have there been new roles maybe that have um, evolved in response to COVID? Um, no, no new roles. Uh, we're, we're much the same. And I think one of the things that people forget, right, when we, whether it's COVID or anything else, I mean, we deal with infectious diseases all the time. Uh, we've dealt with H1N1, we've dealt with a whole bunch of other things, not physically at this magnitude, but again, when you prep and you prepare and you, and you practice uh, and you drill for these kinds of surge events, you actually, and the, how, the hospital industry has something called hospital incident command. We, we our, our accreditation depends on our ability to execute in a way, and it's all written in a book on the shelf, and you take it off the book, and you practice it through time to get and you get graded on it. So these surge plans are important, and we're very fortunate. It has not affected our community to the extent that others have been, and so we have to make sure we're getting back to business. And all of our executives know their job is this much COVID and that much everything else. Thanks, Dr. Slonim. Tim, how about another question from the audience? Yeah, I love this question from Jean. Are you more or less inclined to engage with reps via virtual engagements that they set up, or would you rather prefer the ability to contact reps uh, in your own way? Hmm. Dr. Patel? I'm open to either of the way. I think as long as uh, we have a contact point in the office, my PA, she actually engages with the all the reps and then she figures out based on the need as to how best to do that. So some of them are able to actually come in person to see, some of them are able to do the virtual, but we, we do have some sort of like guidelines as to how much time we can give because the, the things change and and we also created a schedule where one physician and two key staff members are away from work every day because if there's a kind of need for quarantine majority of the staff, we do not want our operations to come to a halt because there's no other chemotherapy infusion suite in about 100 mile radius. So we want to make sure that access does not become an issue. So, so we, we coordinate everything, but it's in a very organized and structured way. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Dr. Slonim, do you want to address that quickly? If you wait for me to call, you're going to be waiting a long time. <laughs> I think that I think that says it all. It does say it all. Okay, like we have Tim. Time for maybe one more. Yeah, sure. That would be great. Folks, if you're still typing, though, keep typing in your questions. If we don't get to them today, we'll take your answers offline for you. This is a nice question. This is kind of a give back question from Alex. What can a rep do to support you, your staff, and your office or health system now? Dr. Patel? Kind of I think, yeah, I think if, if, if they can bring some samples for the patients, because with COVID 19, Dr. what I've realized is when insurance companies don't have enough staff to go for pre approval of the expensive chemotherapy pills. So if there's a way that we can bridge the gap, that patient can have a starter pack to start their treatment and not delay for a month or two until the insurance company, this person can work with us to get it pre-approved. That probably, if patients' medication access can be solved by resources that they have, that would be the biggest help that they can do. For me, my patients are number one priority. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Dr. Slonim, were there any other resources that you haven't already mentioned that would be helpful for you? Dr. Slonim, I think. I, I lost my connection for a second, Laura, sorry. Okay, there you are. I, I lost my connection, I didn't hear you. Oh, okay, so the question was uh, related to what a rep could do to support you right now? Is there anything um, that you haven't already mentioned? No, I think for the most part, uh, I've mentioned a lot of things. One example I will use uh, that I think people can learn from is when we were going through our evaluation of testing opportunities and strategies for COVID, I was inundated by calls with lab vendors and you know equipment testing and other things. And they all just kind of, 
were noise in the background. No one presented to me. The, the people that we chose were the people that could make a difference for us. So the guy that got my attention said, I'm ready to go. This is what it looks like. Your team is busy with COVID operations. We will take the burden for you. We can have you up and running in seven days. Come on in. Not, hey, by the way, would you like to chat about testing? That's not what it's about. Give me definitive executable goals and a timeline that I can manage. Thank you, Dr. Slonim. That's really helpful. You know, Laura, uh, Kristen in the audience asked, how can a new rep introduce themselves to you? And I'm pretty sure Dr. Slonim just answered that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Tim, I, I think we're we're at the end of our hour. Looks like we are. Uh, let me thank the panelists. Uh, uh, Dr. Slotum, uh, those are uh, uh, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank Dr. Tell, same to you. Thank you as well. Thank you very much. And Laura, thanks for moderating. It's always great to work with you. Oh, it was my pleasure, Tim. So on behalf of CMR Institute, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And I'd also like to encourage you to follow the link that's on your screen um, to gain access to several resources that will help you continue to maintain your influence with customers during uncertain times. CMR Institute's nonprofit mission is to provide innovative learning resources that support the relationship between life sciences companies and the healthcare professionals that they serve. For more than 50 years, CMR Institute has provided relevant and ready e-learning resources to improve the value offered by customer-facing teams and ultimately to enhance healthcare. So I encourage you to follow the link and enhance your capabilities and relationships. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Laura. And, and let me add a thank you to everyone in the audience for the time of participation in today's program as well. Just as we close out, again, a reminder, if you're still typing a question or you have any additional questions, please, I'm going to stay here for a few more minutes. Go ahead and send them on into us and we'll get you answers offline. And as we're closing out, I just wanted to share with you, uh, you might have heard some of this and some of them have, have already begun. Our L10 courses have gone virtual this fall. No surprise there. You can visit the L10 website to join up uh, and sign up for our Primetime Fraternities courses, 60s workshops, and the Science and Practice of Modern Learning and Assessment. Also, I'm, and one of the handouts was to save the date on our 50th anniversary conference next year. We're optimistically planning June 7th and 10th in the Gaylord Rockies in the Denver area. Uh, one way or the other, whether it's in person or virtual, we're getting together for our 50th anniversary next year, and you are cordially invited. Please do save those dates and plan to join us. You can find more information at l10conference.com. And just on the website and our L10 on the Go app, have various resources available to you, our partner director, our e-learning lounge, our certificate and, web and um, uh, workshop programs, our webinars, and of course, our focus on uh, training publications. You can find out more information or read uh, current issues or find out uh, whatever you need from any of these on the L10 website or the L10 on the go app. And finally, I'll ask you to join us for our next webinar. We'll be back here next Tuesday. It's coming Tuesday, talking about learning agility. What is it and why do our teams need it? You can see some other programs coming up on our calendar in the next month or so. Any, uh, you can find out even more listed on our on our website here, and we'll register for any of these programs at l10.org slash webinars. Here's the address for our self-directed learning library, where today's recording will be posted. Again, CMR is also going to post this to their site, and CMR will be sending out some follow-up information for all of you to make sure you're connected to that recording, today's recording, and some uh, resources around today's program. The, my email address is showing there on the screen. Finally, if I can help with anything, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm going to just send out final thank yous today to our speakers, Dr. Patel, Dr. Slonim, Laura Hedwer, our sponsors, CMR Institute, and of course, all of you in the audience for joining us today and participating in the H program. Let me wish you a good rest of your day, a good rest of your week, and we will talk to you all soon. Stay safe and be well, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye.